welcome everyone. My name is Larry Devaskian. I'm the founder of a um, new company called Do What You Love, where we share thoughts, ideas, experiences from people who have made their their fun and their joy uh, and the thing they really like to do also their profession, that the two things can be the same uh, and not different. So um, maybe I'm not explaining that perfectly, but the idea is that for some people making music is a, uh, as a hobby that you do on when you're not working, but in the case of Al Jardine here and John Hall and also my friend Peter, who's uh, joining us uh, on the entrepreneur side, they, it's their profession and it's been my profession. So we're gonna be like like archeologists. We're gonna uncover how did you do this and, and how, uh, how, how do you make it work and how do you keep it working? So I'm gonna first introduce Al who's up here. Uh, um, Al, do you wanna say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, hi everybody. <laughs> so what I wanna just say everybody, we also have John Hall who is uh, coming in and is a friend and, and John you want to say hi and hi everybody yeah it's good to be back Larry and I know each other for a long time and done some playing over the years and jamming together and uh, one of these days we'll start writing together we also have Peter with us and who is a, a music entrepreneur and and futurist and and uh, an amazing entrepreneur do you want to say hi Peter Larry thanks yeah hi everybody good to be here Larry and I just re actually we met fairly recently, but Larry being the entrepreneurial guy that he is, we've exchanged a lot of ideas and I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, I, I also uh, just want to thank everybody for coming. The people who have uh, come on this call and bought tickets are 100% uh, of the money that you have spent for your ticket. I am donating to an organization called the World Central Kitchen. And if I could just explain it for one minute, that the World Central Kitchen was formed uh, a while back by a guy named Chef Andres. He's one of the world's great chefs. And after the hurricane in Puerto Rico where they had no power and, and FEMA was not really organized to get there, he just went there with a bunch of people and just started feeding anyone who walked up and couldn't eat and, and had no electricity or no plumbing or whatever. And since then, He's expanded his organization and they were in New York City during the, the height of the pandemic and they fed 10 million meals a month in March and in April to anyone who was unemployed, anyone who uh, like the doctors, nurses, essential workers, and they also hired uh, restaurants to stay open so that people could you know not go bankrupt. So I put in the chat box for any of you uh, the website for World Central Kitchen if you want to check it out, if you want to donate more. But each one of your tickets, each single ticket buys six meals. It's $4 per meal is their net. So each one of you is feeding someone six times or six separate people. So all of you are heroes on this call. It's not just us you know, hosting the event, but all of you are heroes. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I want to start with John Hall, and then I want to jump to Al, and I want to ask the same question, John. If you could give advice to your 21-year-old self about starting a career in music, if you could go back with all your wisdom, decide don't do what I did or don't join music, like what positive advice, what one good thing would you tell your 21-year-old self about having a career in music? Don't take some of the drugs I was taking. <laughs> well, you know, it's true that I think a lot of people, myself included, did some brain damage to themselves. But no, I think that the biggest lesson looking back on it, maybe that I've learned, and one that some musicians don't learn early enough or, or at all, is to try to be original. I mean, it's, you know, I certainly, I played in bands where, you know, we were emulating what the Beach Boys did. You know what Al was doing, or I played in bands where we played, you know, um, Hendrix songs or Cream songs or Beatles songs. And but what what sets me and the guys in Orleans apart now uh, is that we actually developed a sound, and we started doing that as early as possible. You know, I've been writing songs. I didn't call it writing. 
when I, I was just making things up when I was 12, you know, and, um, but gradually got to recognize that they were songs and to get serious about working at them. And, you know, thank God, you know, it's uh, between that and developing a musical style, it's initially harder than playing covers and, and doing other people's material. Uh, and sometimes you have to do both, but, uh, but that's, that would be my suggestion is to short circuit that and go, if you can, straight to writing uh, your own songs. Thank you. Thank you, John. So Al, uh, I want to ask you the same question. If you could go back to your 21 year old self, well, you are probably, my guess is that you're already in the Beach Boys at that age, um, performing or touring. What, 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 what would you give your younger self advice about starting a career in music? Yeah, I get, I get right to the writing aspect, like John was saying. I mean, it's, it's, you know, playing live is a whole different deal than, uh, than uh, recording, of course. Basically, that's all you do is promote yourself by playing around, playing around, that's funny, by uh, playing gigs. And um, uh, so what you need to do is to, uh, develop a, a career based on songwriting. Mm. And uh, it takes time, it takes patience. I guess that's the word. You need to develop patience because it doesn't happen overnight unless you're very lucky, like we were. Uh, and uh, even then, you really have to develop a repertoire and a style that uh, is appealing to people. And not, well, it's, it's all built around the songs. But if you don't have your own songs to play, then you have to play other people's songs. And therefore, your career takes maybe a different path to your your touring career is one path and recording career is another path. Your writing career is another path and publishing and all that. So it's a whole lot of pathways to take on the way to the journey, on the way in the journey towards success. A lot of pathways. So it's difficult. You really have to learn by experience, I think. I don't think there's any way to teach that. You, just, you have to get lucky. Oh, also luck. Yeah, that's a big how, how old were you? Get lucky. Hang with the right people. Hang with good people. Don't do drugs. <laughs> um, how, how old were you, Al, when you started? Uh, 19. So, um, that's when the Beach Boys started, yes? 19. Okay. I have another question for you, Al, which is, you mentioned to me uh, when you came to my NYU songwriting class that, um, that, you know, in the beginning, people told you all kinds of things like you'd never make it or the name of the band was stupid or who are you to get on the radio? What kind of obstacles did, did the band first have that, that everyone just pushed through anyway? I, I remember you telling me that you got a lot of pushback when the band started. Not really, but I get the gist. I get the gist of it. Yeah, the, the people did say that we'd never make it. That was the biggest encouragement uh, that uh, you can ever face is uh, negativity you know, when, when people... And what I learned is that people generally don't want you to have what they... <laughs> But they can't have. So if they can't have it, then you have it. This is one of those strange little things that you can't really quantify unless you get airplay. And then you know you're so but until we got airplay, but that's how kind of unraveled. Uh, when we got airplay and we actually got on the radio, we couldn't believe it ourselves. Uh, but that is verification of uh, of your uh, hard work and willingness to persevere and be patient. Patience really is the key to be patient. And it's like in football, you have to be patient and wait for the ball to come to you. And then you run with it, see? You gotta catch it first though. Then you can do your fancy running, whatever you do. So you have to be very patient and observant and do not listen to the naysayers. That's the most important thing of all. I, I just wanna tell everyone that if you have a question for myself, <laughs> John, for Al, or our friend Peter, uh, please, what you do is you go to the participants list and um, see your name and you click on, on the raise your hands if you want to ask Al or myself or John or Peter a question. And uh, we'll try to get to some of those a little bit later in the call. So Al, I have another question for you. You and I did that uh, Imagine in Central Park benefit for UNICEF. Five years ago on John Lennon's birthday, we sang Imagine for all the people in Central Park. 
wonderful story about being in London and, and meeting John Lennon. Could you tell us that story again about how how you met John Lennon and what happened? Oh, he was, uh, he, he, and, he and George were, were into this thing called transcendental meditation. It's a quite a, 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 an important technique that that uh, Maharishi uh, Mahesh Yogi uh, taught most of us from one, at, at, well, he taught the Beatles first. Then the Beatles came to us and asked us if we would be interested in learning it. And uh, uh, two of the fellows came up to my room up at the London Hilton, and uh, and they asked and they said, I "Forget what exactly what he John was John actually who spoke first, but I, I just saw him through a keyhole in my door, and I thought, well, it must be them." <laughs> and uh, I think I, I just remember getting a, a, a small introductory lecture about TM. And then they, and then they, uh, I think the other two, there are four Beatles, right? So the other two must have gone to the, someone else's room at the, at the Hilton. On the other hand, there's five of us. So I'm not sure how it all worked out to be honest with you. So let's do the math. We'll do the math later. But um, it was an interesting discussion, but I thought it, it was brief to the point and, uh, and later we uh, saw them again in Paris at, uh, at the UNICEF uh, uh, a musical uh, emergency fund for uh, children. And again, there the, the Beatles were, were sitting there in the front row with Maharishi. So that reinforced the idea that Maharishi wanted us to be the, carry the torch in, in the United States, basically what it boiled down to. And so later on that evening, was it that evening or the day after? The next day, we, we visited Maharishi in his hotel room and learned transcendental meditation. Well, that's a great story. Were, were you nervous having the Beatles sitting in the front row staring at you performing? I know that I think probably I could speak for everyone on the call. We'd be a little nervous. I, I don't know. Yeah, it was intimidating. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you, you get accustomed to things like that. But Maharishi was was uh, that was something else to see him out there. And you don't expect to see a a, 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 a disciple of uh, of his uh, ma magnitude. By then he was quite he was world famous, obviously, and he was bigger than us or the Beatles for that matter <coughs> at that time, in his own way. So to have them all sitting there at the same time was was amazing. The whole concert was was had people from all over all kinds of walks of of life, you wouldn't from Mar from Marlon Brando in, in Tahiti had his group come up, and it's to the Russian Army Choir to the Beach Boys. Now, how diverse is that? So we were a little intimidated, yeah. And then the Beatles in the front row with Maharishi. Yeah, that, yeah, the whole thing was kind of rather. Sounds strange like it could have been a Bill Graham show. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to pivot to John Hall. You know, um, yeah, exactly. John. Yeah. So John, when you amazing, really, when you think of, you yeah. know. When I was uh, when I was uh, just really getting going in my music career, John pulled together an enormous amount of very renowned musicians to do a no nukes concert after the Three Mile Island nuclear accident, and and John's coming together to do this no nukes was for me some kind of you know, it was pre We Are the World and, and all of that kind of thing that, that was happening a decade later. What was that like for you, John, to, to I mean, how do you, do you call Bruce Springsteen on this? On, well, I guess there were no cell phones. Like, how do you get, you know, the world's greatest lineup of talent to, to wrangle that, that amount of, of people for a good cause? Just give me the one power of the sun. 
It's kind of the art of the possible or the or the or the uh, stupidity to try to do the impossible. But I've always kind of been what people might think is overly optimistic. But I knew Jackson. I played guitar on his uh, Here Come Those Tears Again uh, single uh, well, on, on the uh, Pretender album. And uh, I played the guitar solo on that. And I played with Bonnie Raitt and produced Bonnie's third album. And so I knew that, you know, both of them and a bunch of other folks who were uh, James Taylor, Carly Simon, uh, Jesse Cohen Young, et cetera. So we were doing a fundraiser for the Karen Silkwood Fund. And you've probably seen the movie Silkwood that Meryl Streep was in. So, you know, the story of her being run off the road by somebody as she was on her way to hand a sheaf of uh, an envelope of documents uh, to a New York Times reporter that would have told about all the spills and cover-ups at the Kermigree, Kermigree plant in Oklahoma, where they were enriching uranium and making uh, parts for uh, nuclear devices. Anyway, uh, so we did this sold out show at the Palladium in New York. And afterwards we're all going, now what? Now what do we do? And, and uh, I suggested that we each call everybody we knew and try to get, you know, as many artists as we could get together to go to Madison Square Garden. And everybody got excited. I didn't call Springsteen. I didn't know Bruce, although I did play uh, my band at the time, Kangaroo, and Bruce's band, the Castiles, alternated shows at the Cafe Wine Greenwich Village in 1968. Um, it was an underage, non-alcoholic um, club. It was like, you know, all the potatoes uh, potato chips and um, and uh, ice cream sodas that you could possibly eat. Um, and we were alternating six shows a day or a night, starting at two in the afternoon, going until 10 at night, when all these underage kids would go home to New Jersey and to uh, Long Island. But, um, you know, so it's, I mean, Al, Al before talked about luck. I mean, there's certainly talent involved. There's also a ton of hard work involved. And, but there's a, there's being in the right place at the right time. And I happened to be playing in Greenwich Village in New York City at a time when the Love and Spoonful had just left the cafe, uh, the Night Owl Cafe around the corner because they had had their first hit with Do You Believe in Magic? Uh, the band that replaced them at the Night Owl was The Flying Machine with James Taylor as the lead singer and rhythm guitar player and primary songwriter and Danny Korchmar, Cooch as he's known, um, who you, I'm sure you're all aware of. He was playing lead guitar. Um, Bishop O'Brien on drums, rest his soul, who played on Carol King's first and I think second albums too. And, uh, and my friend Zach Wiesner on bass, whose father was uh, Jerome Wiesner, the president of MIT. And um, so it, 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 being in the right place at the right time, just I happened to be around all this incredible, I mean, I could go across the street from the Cafe One, see Bob Dylan and Tim Harden having a, a drink together at the, at the Kettle of Fish Bar. And now that place moves, you know, uh, the village is not what it once was. You know, I moved to Woodstock and lived there in a long time and, and Woodstock isn't the same as it was either, but it's kind of a moving target, the musical vibes or the concentrations of players and writers and singers uh, or business music business people tends to move from one place to another and so just finding where is the place for you to go for me to go that's always been uh, a big part of it did I answer your question <laughs> yeah I mean the, the stories are just so great I want to get to one or two questions while we have Al because uh, you know in, in setting this up this is I think his very, very first Zoom because he lives in a remote area and the internet is spotty. So while we have um, a couple of people asking questions, I wanna just ask Meg, uh, Barry, if you wanna unmute and, and uh, you have a question and for, for anyone, you know, please feel free to go right ahead. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. Um, John, I love that photo. I don't know what that's of, but it's beautiful. Um, I have a question about the multiverse. Um, you know, for the last five years, we're swimming in the multiverse. We get to be nice and googly, right? We get to have many facets to our diamond, but it wasn't that long ago, I was thinking uh, that if you were a musician and a professional musician, uh, speaking for myself and everybody I know personally, 
it was like we had to hide that in non musical contexts. And um, John, I was thinking about you becoming a congressman. And I was I realized that that was before we entered the multiverse, you were a congressman. And I just kind of wanted to jump into the slight way back machine and ask you how that was. Did you find that you had to explain yourself or, um, you know, legitimize, you know, your substance in any way? Or did it work for you or against you? I infiltrated them. <laughs> Nobody expected me to be any good, you know, a tree hugging guitar player. What does he know? But I, uh, I've been used to being on stage. I've been used to being heckled. I used to play frat parties when I was in college where people would throw tomatoes or beer bottles or something and, you know, learned how to handle a crowd. And, uh, and also, uh, I just wasn't afraid of being on stage or on camera. So I had a leg up on some of the, I ran against against five other people in a Democratic primary to take on a 18-year uh, Republican incumbent in my district in New York, in the Hudson Valley of New York. And uh, yeah, nobody thought I was gonna win, especially the incumbent didn't think I was gonna win. But um, I surprised a lot of people, including myself. It's, it really is the same thing, I think, that it takes to be a performer. You know, you gotta mm -hmm. be willing to put yourself out there and fail or, you know, impress people or not, but at least you've tried. And that's not something I, I gave my daughter the same advice when she was wondering whether she should try being a poet after mm -hmm. she graduated from Middlebury College. She uh, was an excellent writer. She'd taken uh, a, a writing major up there, English uh, creative writing major, which they're known for. And she said to me, dad, I got, you know, I've got a chance to go into the creative writing uh, master of fine arts program at, at Maryland, or I can work as a paralegal, which she'd already started doing. What should I do? And I said, well, I'm sure it's nice getting a paycheck, paycheck every week with your name on it and starting, you know, renting your own apartment and paying for things and putting it in the bank or whatever. But on your deathbed, you might say, gee, I wonder what would have happened if I tried being a poet, but it's very unlikely you'll be on your deathbed and going, I wonder what would have happened if I tried being a paralegal. Right. And sure enough, she's did a Fulbright uh, scholarship year in Brazil, writing po you know, poetry and fluent in Spanish, Spanish and Portuguese now. And, and she's back to being a paralegal um, in Oakland, California, but, uh, and also translating poetry that's written by South American poets into English so that they can sell it here. So you never know how things are going to work out. But I think the most important thing is to go for it. If you really love something, do it. Like Larry's the name of this session, you know, do what you love. Exactly. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to call on someone else while we have everybody here. Scarlett, who is joining us uh, from New Hampshire, is actually a professor of music at Berkeley College and teaches uh, songwriters. Um, so Scarlett, do you want to unmute and, uh, and share with us uh, your questions? Yeah, um, well, I'd love to address John. Um, John, I have to say, boy, we're at Berkeley and in my own writing, I'm always trying to decode the map, you know, <laughs> decoding how you, how you write songs and then how you get out of the way, right? Like you learn all this stuff and then you just get out of the way and then you try to be the lightning rod, you know, for the song. And there are certain songs that I feel were just meant to be. They just feel like pure spirit to me. And your song Dance With Me is one of those songs. It is just a perfect song. And I wondered if you could, if you've ever thought about the flow state or the you know, the state of mind and being that you were in when you wrote that. And if you go there, you, you seem like you're there right now. You seem like a really calm, <laughs> but, you know, I'm really curious, like that, that process of, of what is your state of being when you're in that state of creativity or downloading, it felt like a download. Well, sometimes it is. Um, and, uh, you know, Al, Al probably should answer this question too. Uh, but for me, 
it's there's a fine line between suspending your self-criticism mm -hmm. which is necessary to get started with writing a song you got to not criticize every idea that comes along oh that's trite or oh that's you know that's not so hot there and so you can accumulate something and then you can work on it and the work is what comes in between starting and finishing a song um and at the end you do need to be critical my first father-in-law um my co-writers uh, johanna's father used to say he was a drama critic and uh and he'd seen every movie and every broadway show and so on as a, in his job so but he said that the difference between a good work and a great work be it a song or a play or a book is uh getting the last five or ten percent you know you get 90 percent of the way there on the lyric and then you get 95% of the way there in the music, and then you cut a corner with the arrangement. And the next thing you know, you got two thirds of what you wanted to have. Yeah. And so, you know, I always remember that. I try to be not critical of my own ideas in the beginning of writing a song, and then get critical toward the end. Al, do you have any uh, thoughts about that? I mean, I think Help Me Rhonda is a pretty perfect song, among others uh, that you have, have written. And it was a, a Brian Wilson composition. And, and it, uh, so I, I can't speak to that one, but it's uh, a couple others that, you know, Larry and I wrote a song called uh, Waves of Love, which I, I really like. Um, and that came together quite naturally and, and uh, was quite uh, fulfilling. And it, um, it, well, having a songwriting partner really helps because it, you can simply easily bounce back ideas of, it, so quickly that something forms rather quickly and you, you can find completion in that. If you write your own, if you're writing by yourself, you generally are lacking either a verse or a chorus or a, or a, something needs to be filled in and then sometimes you get stuck on it and you don't finish it. So, but when you have a writing partner, it all seems to gel a lot more quickly. I don't know if that answers anything. But. Yeah, Al. Um... <laughs> When you were writing your solo album, which I want to share with everyone, this is the 10th anniversary of Al's absolutely delicious and magnificent solo album called A Postcard from California. And for me personally, listening to it, I, it it's like driving down the coast on US-1 with, with your, the top down on a spring day with the wind in your hair and the purple flowers up on the mountains. And it's a really gorgeous um, piece yeah. of art. So I want to ask you about the song, A Postcard from California, because that's a very special song. It, it, it feels like a, it, it really feels like a postcard. Can you tell us about the writing of the title track for your album, A Postcard from California? And I'll be sending you a postcard from California. happy to share that. Um, I hope my voice is not slowing down as I speak, like yours just did. <laughs> it was kind of neat though. It had a kind of, it, it, yeah, it reinforced the, the, the whole concept uh, of, uh, of asking a question. Anyway, uh, uh, the, the origins of any journey start with that very first step, of course, and uh, from Rochester, New York, in 1951 or two, as I recall, uh, we had a, a my, my father relocated the family in San Francisco, and um, the song is about the, the, the journey, and it's kind of neat, you know, to, to recapture that in a way that uh, reflects pretty much uh, what it's like to, to, to take root in a different country, a different nation, a different, whatever, different state. And uh, uh, and so that's what's reflected in the song, basically, is uh, the uh, uh, starting anew in a different, in a different way, in a different place, and uh, starting all over again. And, and eventually uh, ending up in uh, Los Angeles, California, where we formed the Beach Boys. So it all, it was all pretty beneficial for me. Yeah. 
how, how wonderful. I'm going to ask Margaret Dowdle Head um, if she wants to unmute. Uh, I think that she's, uh, she's here with us and she has a question for you. Margaret. Oh, yeah. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Alan. How are you? <laughs> All right, um, you. I'm okay. Uh, I'd like to know if you, and also this question's for John too, can you share anything with, with us about upcoming archival releases? Archival uh, releases? Yes, sir. Release? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, we, I just approved some. Uh, yeah, we're, we're uh, well, my band, our band, our group is releasing some uh, archival footi uh, footage. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, material from Surf's up uh, this 1970-71 period. So, and that that will be coming out in 2021 for our 60th anniversary. If you can believe that. Wow. Yeah, and I have there'll be some fun little uh, reflective moments of you know enjoying the making of the music on that album. Those from those two albums, I should say, Surf Up, Sunflower, and Surf Up. I look for. I think you probably heard about it. This. Heard rumors, but yeah, kind of, it's, it's gonna be it'll, good. That's all I've heard. <laughs> I would say, uh, Margaret, as far as I go, as far as Orleans, my band Orleans goes, uh, we have actually on a couple places we have a website and uh, on Facebook, at, uh, Orleans Music, on Facebook, and also. Uh, we are doing releases of stuff that we found in the archives all the time. We're just, uh, the nice thing for us, one of the positives about this pandemic is we've had a chance to go through the vaults and to go through drawers full of tapes and, and discs and find things. Uh, last week we released, um, we're doing this every Thursday. We, we put up a video of us doing New Country on the Nashville Network in 1986. We, we made a record with, uh, uh, with some of our favorite Nashville artists um, uh, sitting in with us. And it was kind of an attempt at a country rock thing, which Dance With Me today, if Dance With Me came out today, it would have to be a country rock. You know, it, it's be harder to get that on pop radio than on country radio. So it wasn't really a big stretch for us, but um, so we did, a, I think a six song performance on, on this show, Nashville Now, with Bela Fleck sitting in and Bruce Bowden on Steel and. And, um, you know, the record that we made that year down there had uh, Steve Warner playing guitar and singing on it and, um, and uh, uh, just a whole bunch of fabulous uh, players, Chet Atkins, uh, you know, it was one of my favorite projects because of that uh, interplay. But, and then the week before that, we put up a, a trio acoustic performance of me, Larry Hoppin and Lance Hoppin, the other you know, two surviving members. Well, Lance and I are the only surviving members. I'm sorry to say, it's been um, it's been eight years since Larry died. But in our drummer, original drummer, it's been you know since 1984 that he died. But um, uh, long stories that uh, that have to do with a couple of things that we referred to at the beginning of this beginning of this program. But uh, so. Uh, it's it's been good to be able to get at this stuff, and if you're curious about it, I'll put up my my uh, Facebook page link and also the Orleans one uh, in case anybody wants to uh, after the show to uh, check those out. Yeah, thank you, thank you, John. Um, it, please, in the uh, I'm going to ask Alessandro Rotondi, who's with us, who who has a question, and I'm seeing a lot of what looks like kiss posters behind you. <laughs> Alessandro, I, uh, and also a big keyboard. I can tell you're you're really a music fan. So um, please uh, feel free to ask anyone here a question. Hey, yeah, I just want to clarify. That's, those are my dad's posters. You know, he's in a Kiss <laughs> band. But anyway, I was hoping to ask Al a question. So when it comes to uh, maintaining vocal health, I noticed that a lot of people call him the golden voice of pop music, specifically Endless Summer Quarterly. And I'm just wondering uh, if he has any like tips about vocal health in terms of, you know, are there any uh, rehearsal rituals or warm ups or things that you do to maintain a healthy voice before a recording session or going on stage? Uh, that's very, very, thank you for the compliment. 
he must have gotten the end of summer quarterly uh, magazine that that came out recently that alludes to that. Uh, honestly, it's 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 kind of funny, it's kind of comical in a way. Brian and I absolutely have no discipline whatsoever. We're about as lazy. Uh, we 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 could care less, quite honestly, about. For some reason, I oh, it's Carl was Carl was the Carl was the just the opposite. Carl had vocal uh, lessons that would put an opera singer to shame. Well, he learned a lesson from Steve Miller, actually, a, a vocal uh, concept that, warm up. what was that? Warm up. warm up. He learns, he used to warm up every night and drive everybody crazy because he, he just had to, just on our way to the gig, he would start his, his warm up and everyone else kind of went, oh boy, there he goes again. But he had the best, best vocal, he had the best voice in the group, I think. Not because he did the warm-ups, but because he was born with a wonderful voice. And I don't think the warm-ups help one iota, to be honest with you. So all, all the music teachers who go, ah, I know you didn't say that. But the truth is that I just walk up to the mic and sing. Same with Brian. He just, we just, and, and Mike for that matter. Mike has a wonderful baritone. You can't, you can't improve on that. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, there is no technique that I can think of other than the one that Carl did. And Steve Miller can t direct us all to the correct uh, uh, lesson book uh, for that. Uh, it, it, it's a very, uh, it's quite challenging. And Carl had this wonderful range that he could actually express that uh, value. You know what I'm saying? I don't, maybe Brian and I just don't have the, the range. I don't know what it is, but Carl could just sing circles around us, I think. <laughs> And I have total no answer for you. I'm sorry. No, that, that's but, a great answer. That's a great answer. Very uh, true. Carl used to get angry with me because not angry, but he would laugh because I would bring a bag of popcorn on stage, which I don't, and to this day, I can't remember why. Maybe I didn't eat that night. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> just something happened in your voice. I'll tell you, here's, here's also, here, honestly, your speaking voice is different than your singing voice. I know that for sure. It's just something else is you're, you're at a different, completely different level of energy when you sing. It's an energy thing. I think that, that you develop as you grow uh, and you learn new music. You know, you, you learn to sing and your range develops as you sing, possibly because we recorded a lot. Maybe our ranges became greater and our, our, we were able to, to produce on stage pretty closely what we did on recordings because we recorded so much. So that maybe those were maybe Brian was giving us our vocal lessons without our even realizing it, because he was truly the master uh, arranger uh, for all of us, and he would we we all had a certain range that we we parked our voices in, and uh, he recognized that, and we got stronger and stronger and stronger as we went along. So th those were really probably our he was probably our our vocal coach. When you think about about it, but there's no formal formal warm-up for that I ever did for a show or probably should do one for this <laughs> uh, I would say if you're lactose intolerant don't don't drink milk or, or, or dairy products before a show that's important cool I have no I have no answers I'm sorry no, that's <laughs> great thank you thank you yeah, that, that's terrific yeah. <laughs> So I, I'm going to just Welcome. I'm going to just uh, um, move over to our our other special guest tonight, Peter, who is a, a new friend, and he is in the sort of entrepreneur side of music. And I want to talk to him and ask him to to share. You know, he's he's actually recently been making um, publishing uh, deals for for companies and artists. I know that there was a, a deal with, with Primary Wave with the group Boston and with the group Devo. So Peter, I wanna just unmute and, and have you introduce yourself and some of what you do because it relates to how musicians are, are connecting now in a different way to the music business that's different than it was back when I started or John or Al started. So Peter, do you wanna unmute and share some? Yeah, yeah. Um, so first of all, it's great to be here. 
obviously my background's a little bit different than the others. And so my stories aren't gonna be as exciting, but I, look, I was a, I think it all comes from the same place where you're talking about, first of all, just finding a way into the business, whatever that, whatever role you play in it. Uh, it it's about pursuing your passion. It's about, uh, I was a kid in the Midwest listening to the great songs of these artists and I was a huge passionate music fan. And so I knew I was gonna get into the business in some kind of way, but I didn't know how. Uh, you asked the question about what would you tell yourself at 21? Or, you know, if you were 21, what would you tell yourself that you should have done at that time? The one thing, one regret I do have is that I didn't learn guitar. I didn't pick up the guitar then. So I would do that. But apart from that, look, you know, I found a way where I was fortunate I started off in a very different way, but I for, was fortunate to work with NWA at the very early days. And it was really interesting for this kid out of Minneapolis to start work, going out to Los Angeles. Then I did a little work with NWA. Then I continued to get in the media business. I became as um, I be, began running a company that was the precursor to Spotify. So we really started inventing the on-demand streaming game. And so, it was a creative process in an entrepreneurial way where the same lessons apply, I would say, which is, you know, John mentioned it, uh, that you just got to, if you want it, you just got to put yourself out there and you have to, there's going to be a lot of naysayers, you know, when you're building a company or you're writing songs or, you know, whatever it may be, they're going to, you have to get beyond your, your fear of it. Um, Take, just really take action, just do it, and then find a way if you're really passionate. And it's kind of like damn the torpedoes because there are so many pitfalls and it's not the safe path, just like you were talking about your daughter and being a paralegal. Uh, it's, it's, it's a different path, but you don't want to look back and on your deathbed and think, man, I love music and I didn't find a way. So I just kind of, um, I didn't have a grand plan. I just knew I wanted to get closer and closer into it. And so I followed these, this diverse journey of starting off working as an entertainment lawyer actually early on, but got into the business side very soon because I didn't want to be a lawyer, even though it was cool stuff that I was working on. And then I became a serial entrepreneur where we were really innovating when it came to listening to music. So on-demand streaming before anybody even thought for a second that that would be a big deal. That was back in 2002, 2003, 2004. And I can, then I continued to go on that path and, be, and then I started writing about it some more like, so a storyteller about some of this stuff. And I ultimately, for a variety of reasons and to answer your question in a long way, but it's, you know, I'm a big believer in that you don't plan out life, you pursue your passion and you find a way in. I found myself that now my business is such that it's like completely my passion of, I'm working with great songs, great musicians, trying to find them new opportunities in, in this world to, to make money, to engage with their fans, to expand their audiences, to use new technologies, to be able to reach new audiences, audiences, uh, reach new generations, extend legacies, all of that. Mm -hmm. And as part of it, being in the publishing space where I've, I, I've established a lot of relationships um, and I think people can feel the passion in it. And so I've been able to facilitate some of these opportunities where like the Devo deal, Devo was one of my favorite bands when I was a young kid going in college. And so just purely the passion ultimately fueled relationships, which ultimately led to a reality, which, which was a great result for everybody involved, where now you have a band that is underappreciated in the marketplace, but did great things. Their music is now gonna reach people in new ways that they couldn't have done themselves because they have a team of people behind them and we facilitated that. And you know the Boston deal, again, Boston was one of my favorite bands back in the day. And so I was able to ultimately establish relationships that were fueled by passion that led to cool opportunities. And so it's a, it is, you know, I think again, John or Al or, you know, somebody was saying business can be creative. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. You know, I, 
in my heart, I wish I were a guitar player because I love that. I, but I, I love, um, you know, I, I love creativity and creativity takes many forms and bringing new opportunities is something that's really interesting to me. And, you know, the last part of it is that I, I, I'm such a massive believer that these great songs can find new audiences and, and generation after generation. And it's, it's never been more like exciting, I don't think, than it is today in all the different ways that you can reach people with your music, engage with your fans directly. And that's really cool. So you can directly have a relationship with your super fans. And it's great for the artist, it's great for the fan. And, and then my last piece of advice is, kind of floats over all of this where uh, being an entrepreneur, a creative entrepreneur. Um, so it will do a musician, let's say you're a musician, it will do you well, it will serve you well to learn as much about how this, you know, the fans engage with music and how technology is changing that. It will serve you well to really get as deeply versed in that as you can, because it's just, it's a vastly different world of music listening than it was in the past and making money so you can fuel your career and fuel your songwriting. You have to be extremely entrepreneurial, keep on top, top of all these different transformational forces in the, in, you know, in the world and in, that's being driven by tech, a lot of it. Thank you. I, this is, you've touched Peter on two very important subjects that I've had discussions with both Al and, um, and John about, which is, you know, as songwriters, we, we have like a couple of songs that everybody loves. Al has written a bunch of, you know, iconic songs. John has, you know, songs that um, most of the people on here recognize. And we always wish when we sign a publishing deal that the publisher wouldn't just go after the big hit that we wrote, but also really help our new songs. And I just had this conversation with John Hall yesterday that, that you know, he's considering his next move and, and possibly yeah. taking his songs. And, and almost everybody wants to reach over his shoulder and grab Still the One and Dance With Me and Love Takes Time and Half Moon that, you know, was on the B side of Bobby McGee by Janis Joplin. And then all of these beautiful works that he has are you know pushed to the wayside and don't people don't get to enjoy them and so every songwriter and I'm speaking for Al and John and Tony Watson who's going to ask a question in a minute and some other people are um, just hungry to have somebody help us get the music out there and now you're really in the new technology where it's not about the big old publishing companies but there's a lot of more nimble new companies can you talk about this difference and how these new companies can maybe help someone like John Hall or someone like Al. You know, I, I wrote four songs with Al in three days and our song Waves of Love will not only be a, a bonus cut on his reissue, but, but be a single shortly with a new version. How do we get those songs out and, and, and how do we interface with someone like you to get into the right place with these new songs? Well, the beautiful thing is that you don't have to have a gatekeeper anymore. So you have the opportunity now to have a direct relationship with your fans. And so there are, when I talk about technology, it sounds almost impersonal, but it enables in many ways, the more personal, you know what I mean? And so like what I would do is I would really focus on my social, on my social media and looking at the followers I have today and feeding them, like giving, get, getting them excited, which will get you excited. So if you start engaging with them and, you know, they already, they already love your music, right? And they may not know the depth of catalog or, so, and they, they certainly would be, they would be delighted by your new songs. And introducing that and doing it on a regular basis, not just every now and then, but really establishing a rhythm with it and having um, maybe a small team 
and there are a lot of, you know, we can talk deeper about it, but I'll, I'll just speak at a high level. Having a small team of people who are also passionate, um, doing it for those reasons, um, and they, they understand how to help you do these kinds of things to serve your fans well, which will then, and then help you expand that fan base through some of your core music that is most well known. But then as you introduce new music to them, and that will be delightful. It will be delightful to your fans. It will make your songs more valuable. It will get them more reach. And it starts the flywheel and goes over and over and over again. And if you get the right small team that believes in you, I'll give you a perfect example. I can't say the name of the band, but there's, there's one that is a, they're, they're known as a one hit wonder from the eighties, but they're not like they're, they have one song that is really widely known, but I was hardcore. I, they had several albums and beautiful music. And I think their music was underappreciated. I'm actually exploring something with this band right now. And I know, and my, my team knows how we can build it. So not only does that song that people know get, get revitalized again, but we can mine some of their other great songs and bring life to them as well and bring new opportunities to the band that otherwise wouldn't have existed because you have a real team that's resourcing it, putting energy, putting mental energy, a new expertise into it, some other ways of thinking that, um, that enable you to establish a direct relationship with your fans. And if you expand your fan base online through social media, then you start opening up possibilities that can monetize in other ways. It might be syncs that for songs that weren't the obvious songs that can still generate real, real you know, meaningful monetization. I'll give you another example because I think that this is important. So let's just say a song is Netflix. It's a great time, by the way, because there's so much content being made and music fills all of this. Let's say Netflix wants to license a song and somebody's working with you and the obvious song, but maybe there's something not as obvious, but the license itself isn't a lot of money. Let's just say that that's the case. What happens is that people listen to, they're watching Netflix and then they find out what the song was. And then all of a sudden, and this happens time and time again, over the course of the next several months, the listening, the overall listening of your entire catalog has been elevated because it's been featured. So, and that leads to, of course, generating more money as well as expanding your audience. And so even if it was, you feel like the license wasn't a lot of money, for, it's almost forget about that. It's about the fact that it, get, it finds a new way to get into the bloodstream of people and reintroduce the songs and expand, you know, all of those sorts of things. So I think that gets back to thinking about being really entrepreneurial about it, not just looking at the obvious paths, but looking at non-obvious paths that could be really interesting and help and finding some, a few people who can really help you um, leverage these new technologies and social media and all of that. Thank you. That was, that's a really important question. I'm going to call on John Hall in a second. But just to say that uh, there are several people I wish could have heard you just speak. I'm introducing a young uh, college freshman to a big film and TV soundtrack uh, agent in LA. And, you know, this is somebody who has no following, doesn't play live, doesn't have anything. And this person was really interested. And they have just stalled and delayed and been frightened of signing this very non-exclusive contract that's very standard and their parents got a Manet Phelps lawyer involved and you know it, then it all got complicated and I just want to shake this person say the worst that can happen is what you have now the best that can happen is millions of people hear your song on a Netflix show or a movie title soundtrack and you make a lot of money and get famous. Like that's somewhere between where you are now and a lot of money and famous is what this next step is. And, you know, I always say to people that the only thing standing in the way of you and success is you. 
you know, get out of the way. I'm, I'm not saying sign away all your rights. I'm not saying just trust, you know, Louis Lump Lump who sends you a letter in the mail saying, we're going to make you famous in five minutes. But just what you just said, we are, I'm, I'm, I hate to use the B word because it sounds so carnivorous, but but brand, you know, musicians now are brands and like actors and artists and painters and photographers. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I guess, uh, look, I, I hear what you're saying. I, when you say brands, whatever, it, whatever label you put on it, your fans want to hear from you. They want to hear from you. And so they may know a, a, a few of your songs and love them, but it's an opportunity to feed them more and expose them to more. And so, you know, they, your calling card may be one thing, but it opens the door to so many different possibilities. And then when it comes to an artist, like in your specific example, if I were, if I were advising somebody who's going to sign with anybody, I'd want to know, I'd want to make sure I'm getting the attention. And so like, I'm not going to be buried in some major company someplace and that I have real resources devoted to me and that they're the right resources who understand that the world of music and engagement by consumers has changed significantly and is trans it's transforming before our eyes and they better help me leverage all of those possibilities to reach my fans. That's the beautiful thing is that you can put people out of the way and you can directly have this kind of relationship with them and they will pay for it. If you got to look, Everybody has to earn a living. So, you know, when I say pay for it, I'm, I'm not trying to be crass about it, but you got to make a living too. But it's, they, there's nothing more powerful than the fan of music, nothing. Like that's the, the, when you think about all forms of media, there's nothing else like it. And so fans will pay for access to you and your songs. And if that means that it's going to be a release of, a song that's in your catalog or a, a vault someplace, they're going to love it. They're going to want to engage more with it. So th that's the way I would think about it. Um, John, I, John has something he wanted to add into this. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the exciting thing for me about what Peter was just talking about is that this applies every bit as much to someone who's just starting a career, to somebody who has not yet written a famous song. I mean, what I'm hearing and seeing among some people I know is that they can make a record in their closet nowadays if they know how to work with technology and they and they can reach their fans on the level that they're starting at or that they are currently at. And, um, you know, so it's really important to that not, uh, I think that, that uh, I not think of this just as um, a way for me and Al to get more of our catalog worked and make more money out of it although that would be nice of course but uh but it's it's very exciting for someone who's starting out it, when we were starting out alan i didn't have that available i couldn't sit here like i do most days right now uh because i'm staying home most days like a lot of people are and and record at home or shoot video at home that winds up actually being a record and um so it's, you know, things have changed a lot and it, it has leveled the playing field somewhat. I think getting to the, you know, Peter's talking about going directly to the music directors at these different um, film companies, TV networks, uh, et cetera. Uh, I happen to know a couple just because of a personal connection, but most of the things that I watch on TV or, or movies, I wouldn't really know my publisher would know how to get to those music directors, but I, I don't know. And I, I think for somebody who's at a lower, at an earlier point in their career, starting out or is somewhere in the middle, that's the thing that is uh, maybe a little harder to, to achieve. But the great thing about it is that you have now, that any musician, no matter what era, has an ability to, a, a new outlet for them and the work that they have have done. And so in the past, there was a more limited way to get that out there. Now you have control to be able to do that. And it may be just for the sake of releasing it out into the world, or it may be, you know, it could be for a variety of reasons. But the exciting part is that it's timed. 
a, a piece of advice is just to experiment for everybody out there is just to experiment because there's so many things that are happening. Nobody knows what the magic formula is. I don't think there is a magic formula, but it's almost like the rules of the game have been changed so drastically because you used to have all you know, the big powerful labels and all that. Now you have ways that can shatter all that, go directly to your fans. You have new ways to create music. You have new ways to distribute music. And that's in, from, from an artist's perspective, I think it's incredibly exciting. 